Okay, let's continue. Uh, the next presentation will be given by Vdenek Kabelač, also from ahead. He will join on the topic of the previous presentation and give more information about the LVM provisioning. So, hello. Uh, my name is Vdenek Kabelač. Uh, I work for Earthhead and I am the person behind the thin provisioning code in LVM in user space. And before I will continue with the presentation, I would like to ask first, how many of you have some experience with thin provisioning? How many of you have never created any thin pool? Yeah, so just three. So I will just uh, say a few words at the beginning. Uh, thin provisioning is about, we, we already have a nice introduction by Lukas in a, in the previous talk. Uh, so you should probably have some picture what what it's about, how it works uh, with the device mapper and LVM. Uh, in LVM, we uh, usually provide uh, some space. So if uh, I will ask again, uh, LVM uh, experience, uh, uh, have you created any LV? Those who answer that they have not cre created thin pool. Uh, do you know how the LV creation works? Yeah, okay, so, <laughs> so normally you create LV and you allocate sp space from your TV. And uh, the th thin provisioning is about that the large allocations like in gigabyte sizes are made still from the user space. So you have a space or volume where you have the space uh, for your data and the Thin provisioning is about the moving uh, small allocations to the kernel so the kernel can allocate the space as is needed. So you share large volume between the multiple volume. And that's short introduction and my talk should be mainly about the news we have added over from the last year. If anyone remembers my last year talk, uh, this talk will be focused on presenting new new updates. Uh, then I will say a few words about some tools. Uh, users might not know about them or might miss them. Uh, then uh, I will do a couple slides about the problems and how, how you can solve them. Uh, best practice, performance issues. Uh, when we discuss with the people, uh, we usually uh, see that they uh, do same mistakes again and again, so this should be it. Uh, and uh, some ongoing news on LVM2, so what do you may expect in future months? And at the end, limitations and maybe demo if there will be a time for that. But we will see. So what we have updated from the last time. Ton of fixes, I think there is uh, like 200 uh, update lines from uh, what's new between the last year version and this year version. We will see how the external origin work, uh, snapshots, profiles, online metal This is, the, th these are the key updates in the thin provisioning area. So external origin, has anyone any idea what it's about? Has anyone heard about that? No? Well, it's a nice feature. Uh, generally, you can use it uh, instead of all snapshots. I, if you want, if you have a volume, a normal volume, and you want to take a snapshot currently, you cannot normally use thin provisioning because thin provisioning needs the whole volume to be also part of the thin pool. So the external origin allows you to use your normal LV as you, as you have it and do a snapshot into a thin pool. Of course, uh, there are limitations. And the key one is that uh, you cannot match back for now, you cannot match back what has been changed back to the external origin. And the other one is that the external origin from that moment has to be read only. 
and you cannot modify it, of course, because all the changes have to, have to go through the thin pool already. So how we on the picture? So the, there you have your thin volume, which is feed for the unprovisioned chunks from the S10 origin, which is read only. And those chunks which were written are taken from the thin pool. Uh, advantage is that this external origin can be used for many and many different thin volumes. So you can use one external origin like a large image, VM image or whatever, and you can have multiple thin volumes which are the snapshot of this external origin. So you generate large image of your Q KVM uh, guess and you can have multiple instances using this same image through the different thin volumes. Each of them will be uh, independent snapshot. So that's how it, you can use your normal LV. It could be normal LV or it could be a thin volume from another pool that's also stackable. So you can create really interesting trees of devices. Uh, not that I would advise to use it, but it's possible. And how do you use it? So there are two ways. One is that you already have your external origin uh, prepared. It, as I said, it must be read only. And because the kernel does not allow you to switch the volume from uh, read, uh, write mode to read only mode, uh, well, it's allowed, but the wh whoever has this volume open in write mode can continue write to device. So this needs to be fixed on the kernel side. So meanwhile, we require that the volume is uh, deactivated before you can use it. If it already is external origin, it could be activated because we know that it has been activated as a read-only volume, but as long as it was a normal volume, you have to manually convert it to read-only volume and switch it off, so deactivate it. So two steps, two, some extra steps are necessary. The other, so th that's basically the first line. As you can see, it, it seems like you are taking normal snapshot, except you specify a thin pool, and that's it. So as long as we know the VG, uh, the name of the external origin, the thin pool, you create the normal like snapshot. So I think the interface is pretty easy to try it. And the only thing you have to remember is that the volume must be read only and must be deactivated. If you are taking a second snapshot, it doesn't matter. If it's already external origin, it could be active as a read only volume. So it's not a problem. Of, uh, and at the same time, you can still use it as a normal snapshot, of course. So the stacking gear is crazy a bit, but we try to be, we try to uh, preserve attributes from the volume. So the other way around is that you have your LV and you want to convert it to thin volume, basically. And that's another way. So you specify the VG uh, LV you want to convert. Again, you specify your thin pool, and you specify a uh, new name for that external origin. So if you imagine that you have an LV and you want to convert it to external origin, it's obvious that your LV has to be renamed to some new name. That's this new name. Uh, this volume will be read only and will have all the required uh, properties and the new L uh, or the your original LV will appear in the system as the thin volume. So this is this all could be made uh, on the live system. So you can uh, convert your active running mounted volume to external origin, basically online. You do not have to deactivate unmount, you just convert it to thin volume, and you, uh, from, from this moment, all the writes to the volume and all the reads will go through the thin pool. And unprovisioned chunks 
are taken from the external origin. Those which have been already written or updated are taken from the simple. Again, it's probably the best to try it yourself. It's not a big magic, it's, it just works. So that's about external origin. No, as I, uh, I, I, I have it uh, in a bit later, uh, and I have also mentioned it earlier that you cannot merge back the changes to the external origin. That's so far the limitation. No, no, imagine that the external origin becomes something like a hidden volume for the user. So there is a hidden volume used by the theme pool or as the external origin, and you are presented with a fake virtual volume back to the users, uh, to the accessible, as, as, an, as an accessible volume. So we uh, preserve in the LVM internal state and we do not allow to remove external origin unless uh, you want to remove all the thin volumes which are associated with this external origin. So we preserve the properties we do not allow you to make a mistake, at least we try. You may eventually try to find a bug, but uh, there are a lot of tests, and so if you find a bug in this, it's, it's our fault. But we do not allow to activate or change uh, the volume back to write mode, for example, so that's so. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, th this is not yet implemented. We No, we, we will support, uh, that, that that's in the future plans, we will support that we will ex allow to extend your thin pool with your LV. So basically we will attach the LV back to the pool as, as, as a whole LV. So, and we will create a special mapping in the metadata to import it. So th this is something different. This is uh, for the use that you want to have the volume separately you do not have to, because once it would be moved to the thin pool, you cannot get it back, that's, that's the problem. So with this, you still have your external origin as normal LV. Once you no longer need those snapshots, you are free to convert it back and you, once you remove all the thin volumes, the volume could be again reused as a normal LV. We do not uh, protect this. So as soon as you remove all associated thin volumes, you are back to your normal LV. So for trying how, how it works, I think it's, it's a good way because you do not lose your original volume. Well, you can remove the thin pool and all the external origins are preserved. So where is my snapshot? We now get a lot of questions that uh, the thin provision snapshot are not available in your system. Um, that is a bit, uh, have, uh, well, we, ha we have changed the default behavior here. And uh, now the default is that when you create a snapshot, by default uh, it's created as an inactive volume. And it has also a flag that when you run like activate all LVs in VG, these volumes will be skipped. The idea behind it is that when you create a lot of uh, snapshots, like you have a volume and you create a snapshot every hour, so you have 24 snapshots a day, for example, and that would uh, be kind of pointless to activate all the volumes in the system. And the uh, probably more important point is that uh, there are uh, file systems like BetterFS which are get uh, quite confused when they notice that they have multiple same drives in the system. So they have like same signatures and BetterFS so far is somehow not able to cope with that. Uh, we will probably need to fix it in the stack, but the, the, this limitation currently saves the user the, with the problem how to deal with multiple volumes and 
scary errors from BetterFS, which tries to know to fix something and without the result. Uh, there is a way how you can switch uh, the behavior back to, to your um, older, uh, expe maybe expected behavior, that you can disable this feature. So if you prefer to get your snapshots active and available always, then you can, in the configuration file, you can switch it off. Uh, if you want to recognize how this snapshot, uh, or if, it, if this snapshot is skipped from the activation, there is a new attribute at the end of attribute uh, field in the LDS, which is the letter K, which means that the volume is skipped from the activation and as you can see, you can you, you create snapshots this way and you can select yourself if you want to skip it from the activation on the command line through the LV change or direct the, the argument on, on the creation time. And there is a biggest controversial point that now when you run LV change AY, which normally activates your LV, and this LV is marked as, as skipped, has the letter K, and you run it without the large letter K, the activation, uh, the volume will not be activated. It's skipped. So unless you switch, switch the skip flag or you pass the ignore uh, option, you will not be able to activate the snapshot. So you have to always think if it's a good time to activate the snapshot, and if it is, then pass the, pass the option and activate the snapshot. If it's not, then it, it will it might save your file system. So this is one a new uh, for the snapshot. And the second one is that we now support the snapshot merge like we support it for the original old snapshot. So if you have a snapshot and you want to ma uh, like match the snapshot back to the origin, uh, for the thin volumes, it basically means that you remove the origin and replace it with the snapshot. But since you can have it mounted, you cannot uh, replace it um, on the live system. So the feature here, it's mainly about, uh, we are now able to defer uh, this switch to the time when, when it's possible. So with the activation of volumes, we are able to swap uh, volumes and use the origin, uh, use the snapshot as the origin. Advantage from the old snapshot is that this uh, swap is instant. So with the old snapshot, uh, the chunks have been, uh, were converted back to the origin on the background, so it took quite some time. If the snapshot was large, especially there, are, there were users who were uh, using snapshots with the gigabytes in sizes, so all snapshots were moving on in the background, the blocks from the snapshot to the origin. Now, with the thin provisioning, it's just an instant operation. Uh, and as I said, we so far do not support merge to the external origins. So if you use the external origins, so far, do not expect that you can match the updates back to the origin, unless you do it yourself through some mirroring and DB. Okay, uh, next uh, improvement, profile. Uh, we already have a lot of options, and uh, Basically, most of the options could be configured on the command line, but uh, there, there are now, there is now need to have, a, let's say, more complicated complex of uh, options. And we decided to support it through the profiles, and I will try to explain how it could be used. We support only a very limited set of options, so only few few options from the LVM conf file can be used in the profiles. 
because it requires extra code to handle this. Profiles are also stored in the metadata. Their use is very simple. We just say the dash dash profile and you select your profile and you create, for example, a pool. And now what could be in the profile? Uh, pools uh, are uh, l um, volumes which have some properties and some of them have a big influence on the performance of the pool. So there are users which do require large chunks and want to have a huge speed on provisioning. And there are users which require a lot of snapshots and they care about security, for example, or something like that. So um, in thin provisioning, we have options, uh, chunk size, zeroing, um, and these all influence the speed. If you select a large chunk and you enable zeroing, of course, if you have pick one gigabyte chunk and you select zeroing, then provisioning of the chunk means that the thin pool target needs to zero one gigabyte when it's open or, or takes new chunk. So for large chunks, we advise to use, to disable or not use zeroing because then you would get a poor performance and we get some reports that users trying to use this, but. So we introduced the profiles. We have two default profiles. You can create your own profiles and select or tune some variable as you like. That's, that's what the feature is for. As of 3.13 kernel, you are now able to online resize your metadata. Uh, this is a very nice feature because until now users were usually stuck with the small metadata. They usually try to create a small uh, pool, then they resize the pool and suddenly they run out of space in the metadata. So this it, uh, it, it's been possible to resize the metadata offline but now you are able to resize it with online. The, but uh, you really need this kernel, which is now in RC1 version, as far as I know, as it's running on my laptop. Uh, resize can be automated through DMUND. I will probably mention it later. So now just a uh, few options. Uh, thin pool has two fields like the snapshot has in the past. So we have the, when, when, when the resize should happen and how big uh, increase should happen. Uh, you can resize online your key metadata device, which is normally private, but we allow or we support this resize because you do not change the state of the volume. It has to be active, so with this, you can online resize your metadata now with the latest kernel. Do not try it with the older one. Uh, there is a check, so we detect the version, but there was an intermediate version in, the, in some pre-RC kernel uh, which was failing. So this bug was fixed, but uh, the other way how to resize the pool and the metadata is that we support the LV extent use policies, which uh, actually does what the DMUN do, do. So it checks if the data volume is below the threshold. If it's not, if it's above, it will resize it. If the metadata volume is above the threshold, it will resize it. So this is it. Thin provisioning tools. Um, they are, at least in the Fedora and REL, stored in this package. In Debian, I think it's different name. Um, it consists of quite a few tools. Uh, check uh, will detect the errors in your thin pool. Dump may dump uh, your thin pool data as an XML or human readable format, and it can even try to repair them. I do not probably want to go to details with this option, but uh, if we have time later, then maybe. Uh, restore will restore your XML file to some device, again to use it for, for as a metadata. Repair is basically a combination of these tools together. 
a new tool now available in Fedora is Airmap tool, which is able to show you to which volumes your blocks are um, allocated. So now you basically reverse mapping, so you know which blocks is used for which volumes. And there is a help tool which uh, should give you an advice uh, how big your metadata should be if you will pass in parameters how many snapshots you want to use, how big volumes you want to plan to use, and so on. It's probably worth to note that this package will al also contains uh, similar tools for the caching, for the cache. Now problems and solutions. Filters. Um, we can discuss it forever, this topic. Uh, the common mistake is that the host machines and guest machines all sees the same uh, metadata, which is completely wrong because you should always uh, prevent the guest machine or the, the host to manipulate with the guest's LVM. So the, the we always suggest to use visor sync. So you have your TVs. So specify exactly which TVs you want to use. In this case, it's a root device and reject everything else. And why we suggest this? Um, with the UDF, the device is available through many, many different names. So if you just try to specify it differently, you can hardly avoid to get your unwanted devices to be visible. So I would just suggest to use whitelist things, specify exactly which devices are your PVs and reject everything else. This is the best way. Uh, with LV Metadi, there is now a new option. I am not going to the details. If you ha will have time at the end, maybe. So let's skip it. Avoid running out of space in the thin pool. Uh, we have not yet resolved all the policies, so do not expect that uh, if you allocate a 10 meg uh, pool and you create a one gig volume, it will work, it will not, it will stop. It will wait for the pool to be resized. So you may experience it easily. You create a small pool and you overfill it and your um, command which is filling the data to the volume will block and it will wait for the resize. If you have not enabled uh, your DMVND with these thresholds, because the default value is now 100, so it's users or administrator responsibility to use the right value, uh, it will wait for the administrator to resize the pool. So either configure DMVND with the proper threshold setting or um, be prepared to watch yourself for the remaining space on the pool and update it earlier than you run out of space. Same applies to metadata. And thin pool really needs a resize to, to, to unlock your pool. So the typical problem user has is when he does not create a proper filter that he has accept all devices. And so your active thin volumes become also available as a devices. So all the LVM commands usually scans devices so they will block themselves when they try to read it. So the ne nice trick here is that you can uh, set proper filter line. That's really important. And then uh, you can uh, go around. It's a hack, but you know it can save you uh, some something. And you disable the locking. So even if some LVS commands, which usually you will use when you try to see how big free space you have, will be blocking your lock, LVM meta, uh, VG lock, then you can go around it. And it's it's a trick that might be useful. Yeah, but this is not yet supported from the LVM. 
Yeah. Uh, PM pin target, pin pool target now support the switch to error. So we have to add uh, policies to support it. And you will be able to select either to wait for space extension or directly fail out your device. So, but this is not yet supported as true in the LVM side. Now, what is the PM spare volume you can see now if you list all volumes in the VG? It's a volume we use uh, for repairing your meter data. It's, uh, we decided to go this way, so we pre-allocate the space. It's a hidden volume, so you do not normally see it with normal LVS listings, but we have the space where we can uh, recover metadata. Recovering of metadata is still a topic we discuss every day and try to improve it, but so far uh, there is a sim simple command you can run with the latest version of LVM2, and it will try to repair or fix your metadata in case there is some problem. So what will be the result of such, such command? Uh, there will be a metadata device with fixed uh, metadata. There will be a new PM uh, or another allocated PM spare volume. And there will be your old metadata. We preserve your old state. So you can always analyze yourself what has happened. So once you are satisfied with the fix, you can remove your old metadata if they are no longer needed. And you should uh, yourself currently PV move your metadata volume to the proper PV. So far, it's not automatic. So we always suggest to use uh, SSDs for metadata and spindles for data volume. So the fix is not uh, trying to specify the SSDs, but it tries to find any space. And if it finds it, allocate it and use it for repair. Here are some examples. I tell I'm right out of time. So uh, creation of um, pin pools from other volumes. So you can always convert data volume and metadata volume and create a pool. This is the single for those three people who never seen how it works. This is how, how you create your pin volume. And this is how you create your external origin volume. I think this, this one was already there. So these are just the simple examples. Now some best practice, best practices notes. Uh, what we learn from the users. Well, uh, we get some comments like pin provisioning is slow. And it's from the people who run pools over the loop volumes mounted over the file system, uh, which are doing their own allocation. So if you have some problems with the speed, always uh, use the real volumes. Uh, do not try to give us some uh, comments that the pin pool is slow when, it, when you run it over better FS, for example, support. So uh, pin provisioning does its own provisioning, and so you multiply the amount of work to be done. So this is really important. We expect that the metadata are located on different spindle at least, and preferably on, uh, on SSDs. The metadata volume size is small, usually, or the maximum size is 16 gigabyte, usually it's much smaller, so like 100 megabytes or so. So this should be on the SSD. If you don't have, well, expect a slower performance. Chunk size has a big influence on, on the performance as well. So if you expect a lot of snapshots, chose a small chunk size. If you expect to not use sna snapshot feature, go with the bigger ones, at least let's say half meg or so. Zeroing is something you should also consider if you want space to be zero before you use it or you can accept that the volumes may see the data as they were 
flush from the from pool. And uh, you know, lattice kernels always have fixes as well as lattice tools. So before you report a problem, try to avoid it to report it on the two years old system and kernel because the bugs are everywhere and fixed all the time. So preferably use the latest kernels and as, as, as the situation holds. Few news, uh, early metadata is now a daemon which is caching the metadata from disk. I think we do not have much time to mention that all, but it should now work. So we are close to say that we do not see a big problems with it, but well, you know, Fedora show, show, shows, shown us a lot of problems with it, so I think the latest version in Fedora 20 is almost usable, nicely. I hope so. And what is uh, now cooked in the Git tree of LVM is the support for caching, so you can now, uh, you should be able to use an SSD as a cache pool we call it, uh, basically it's a very similar thing like pin pool, so you create a cache pool and you associate it with an LV. So cache, cache pool has some policy, how, how the caching works and you cache your LV in the pool. I think we are running really out of time, so as always, um, if you create really complex device tree and something falls in the middle, it might not be a, an easy task to repair it. It's usually always possible, but requires some knowledge. So before you do that, uh, do yourself some experiments if you are able to work with that. Always good advice. Um, VGC HG Restore with Himpulse, uh, it's probably uh, another discussion for an hour, what you can or how you can fix your metadata if something goes really wrong. By the way, have anyone lost any data because of Himpulse or anything? Well, no, no, no hands. So we are good, I think. <laughs> um, system the services, it's uh, evergreen topic. Uh, uh, we are trying to fix it, but not a lot of people, even in the system D group, are, is able to answer our questions and uh, solve our problems. So it requires time. And I think this is this is it. So if you have any questions about LVM, I really advise uh, this this URL sources for Git and ask questions from developers. That's it, any questions? No. <laughs> so I, I think we are really running out of time. So if anyone wants to see a live demo, come to me and we can do a short demo how, how, how things work together. So if you really